Alright, so these are your first set of notes, and this is just going to be a brief intro to zoology and how it's part of biology. So, just a basic definition, zoology is the study of animals. So there's a few characteristics of animals that make them different from other living things. So first of all, they're a branch on the evolutionary tree of life. And they are also part of a large limb of eukaryotes. So if you remember from bio or other science classes, eukaryotes, they have a nucleus. Um, they're unique in nutrition. So they're all heterotrophs, which means they don't make their own food. They have to capture their food or eat other organisms in order to get their nutrition. And they're not capable of photosynthesis, and they lack cell walls. So as you remember, photosynthesis is making your own food. So zoology is a broad field, but there are many subdisciplines. So you did some of this on your intro, but there are some examples. So cytology is the structure and function of cells. Histology is tissues. Parasitology is animals that live in other organisms. And then ichthyology is the study of fishes. If you look in tables 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 in your text, you'll see many, many other different types of studies. So an evolutionary perspective. So the evolutionary process explains these relationships. So how are different animals related? How is there such a variety of animals? So the evolutionary aspect is going to explain some of that. They resulted in what is believed to be four to a hundred million different species of animals living today is due to an evolutionary process. And as we continue, there's also something called organic evolution. So organic evolution is the change in the population. So it looks at the diversity. So it's the source of animal diversity. And it also explains, once again, those relationships within those groups of animals and why certain species are closer related than others. There are also groups of, more, groups of individuals are more closely related if their DNA is similar. So if you look at humans and Chimps, for example, we have more of a similarity between our DNA than, say, humans and bears. So from an ecological perspective, so if you remember, ecology is the study of the relationships between organisms and their environment. Now, obviously, the environment isn't necessarily a living thing. You could talk about animals and plants, which is part of ecology, but this is also talking about your abiotic factors. Okay, so there's two main problems of concern with the ecology here, is there's a global overpopulation. So this global overpopulation results in more and more habitat destruction, the animals being removed from where they're living, and the most growth is actually in your less developed countries. And then there's also the exploitation of resources. So oil, fossil fuels, deforestation, all of those things are used to our advantage as humans, but they're affecting the animals that live in the world as well. So there are some solutions. So we can do, try to have a better understanding of the basic ecological principles. And we also need to prevent the spread of disease and famine. Those types of things do also affect the environment. And a better resource management. We need to do more self-sustaining things, not rely so much on fossil fuels or cutting down rainforests in the Amazon. So animal systematics, then, is to arrange these animals into groups showing these evolutionary relationships. So we're back to the evolutionary aspect. So this is just an example, but they show reptilia is at the bottom, but as you go up, they become more and more specific. So like these two are closely related, or more closely related, than like these two would be. Okay, and we'll go over these more in class. So phylogeny then is an evolutionary tree based on these characteristics. So here's a different type of way of looking at it. This one kind of goes from the middle. So you have your ancestral protus and then you branch off. So the sooner it branches off, the more ancient the species. So if you look, our highest branch is up here. So that would be our highest branch, and then you look at those species there. And then you also look at, so if you have two branches here, those are going to be more closely related because they came from the same place. And then a character is just any specific trait. So like no body cavity, radial symmetry, a coelom, a pseudocelum, all of those things are known as characters. 
So there are a couple patterns of organization as well. So symmetry and asymmetry are the biggest thing that we look at in terms of an organism and how it's organized. So symmetry means it can be cut in half and be equal on two sides or all sides. So there's two types of symmetry, radial and bilateral. And then asymmetry is the absence of a central point of axis. And examples here are sponges. They don't have any symmetry. So our two types a little more in detail. So a radial symmetry means you can divide it any way, and it's still the same on both sides. Bilateral means that you can only divide it one way. So for example, humans have bilateral symmetry, and something like a starfish has radial. So starfish, humans. And then here's an example of your radial symmetry. So this is obviously not a living thing, it's just a pot, but this is a sea anemone. So this is going to have symmetry no matter which way you divide it. You could go here, 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 here. You could keep going. Any way you divide it, you're going to have symmetry. Bilateral symmetry, on the other hand, is where you can only divide it one in one direction and it'll be the same. So if you look here, if you divide here, that's not the same. If you divide here, Nope, that's not the same either. The only way to divide is this way. So you divide right down the middle. So there are a couple other patterns of organization, and this talks more in terms of the tissues. So you have a unicellular level, which is just your protista. Your protists are considered a simple organism, but if you think about it, they have to do all of the functions that we would have different organ systems for in one cell. So they're not necessarily simple, but they are just one cell. So your diploblastic is going to be multicellular organisms, but they have a simple tissue organization. So your examples here, so you know what we're talking about, are jellyfish or hydra. And they do have this tissue organization simply to allow for movement. Otherwise, they won't be able to move. And then their body parts are only in two tissue layers. So they have an ectoderm. So if you think back to prefixes, ecto means out, okay? So this gives rise to the epidermis or your skin for them, and it's used for muscle contraction for movement. So then your endoderm, and if you, endo means in, gives rise to the gastrodermis, which in these organisms is their digestion. Okay, then we have our triploblastic. So these animals have three layers. So they still have the ecto and the endo, but now they have a mesoderm, which is in the middle. So ecto, same thing, gives rise to the epidermis or the skin, endo, gastroderm, or your digestive, and then we have the meso, which is your supportive muscles, contractile, and then blood cells. So triploblastic continued. They do have organ systems. Okay, think about us as humans. We are triploblastic. We have nervous system, digestive, reproductive, circulatory, etc. We have all these different organ systems that are specialized to what our body needs. And also, these organisms are, at, are organized even further based on body cavity. So it's this fluid-filled space, and we'll look at this in much greater detail. But there's three types of organisms. So once they're triploblastic, then they're divided even further into being acelomate, pseudocelomate, or just coelomate. And that's the end of your notes.